Good to see you here today. Delighted you have chosen to come and to worship with us. Uh, Stephen, I know, mentioned uh, the superhero party uh, over at the community center yesterday. We are deeply grateful uh, for each and every person who helped out with that. Um, I, this year, was the first time that I think I've missed it um, and was planning on going until I got an invite to go out to breakfast. And, uh, and, and I, I, all I will say is, I, you know, as much as I don't mind being over there with little kids, I, I'm not a superhero. But as much as I like being with those little kids, I like eating breakfast much more. And, and Shannon, I will tell you, you missed it. You missed it. Uh, if you have your Bibles and New Testaments with you this morning, I invite you to turn to John's Gospel, John chapter 21. There are 19 verses that I want us to read there uh, this morning as um, the basis uh, for our sermon John chapter 21, we're going to begin reading in verse 1, where John tells us that afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Years ago, there was a major insurance ad for a major insurance company that, that said sometimes life comes at you fast. And one of the ads showed a lady who, having just learned that she had won the lottery, suddenly ran into a truck filled with dirt. And another ad 
It showed a man who got in his car to start it, and when he turned the ignition, the car simply fell apart, bumpers and fenders and that sort of thing. The point they were trying to make is that indeed it's true that sometimes life can be more than we can deal with. I mean, there are those times, are there not, when we would like to simply uh, step aside from the push of living and just be comfortable. Such was the case for the disciples in our text this morning. Think about it. These disciples had been on an emotional roller coaster with the events of Good Friday and Easter the subsequent appearances by Jesus himself. These disciples had been on an emotional roller coaster that had left them exhausted. And at the point of exhaustion, they decided to return to that which they knew best, fishing. The simple fact is, you and I read our Bibles and we pray. We attend Bible studies and worship, and those things show that we have some interest in exactly how God fits into our world, but let's just be honest. Many of us hope that God will be doing whatever God does without involving us too deeply. Much like the disciples in our text, we simply want to step aside. But here's the thing, you and I are not called to live in safe harbors, okay? Not at all. We're called through the grace of another day to grow towards being the person that God has created us to be. In short, as the old saying goes, God isn't finished with me yet. Neither is he finished with you. God continually pursues us as Jesus pursued the disciples at the Sea of Galilee, calling for you and I to be about what he would have us do in life. Understand, the Sea of Galilee represented a safe harbor for the disciples. For those who went fishing, it's what they knew. It's what they had done uh, for years before Jesus came and called them them to follow him. Uh, I mean, after all, it was by catching fish that they had made their living. And now Jesus is gone? Well, they simply chose to return to the safe harbor of fishing. Earlier, Jesus had given Simon and the others uh, the grace of another day when he called them to drop their nets and follow him. They had been witnesses to miracles as the lame walked and the blind saw and the deaf heard and the hungry were fed. They had had the scriptures open to them through the teachings of Jesus. And speaking of the grace of another day, they had seen Jesus come back from the grave, breaking the chains of death. Jesus had given uh, Simon a great new vision when he called him the rock on which he was going to build the church. But eh, Simon had already demonstrated he was anything but a rock when he denied Jesus three times. But in our text for this morning, Simon is being given the grace of another day. What it meant was he has the gift of another day to begin being that rock, to begin fulfilling that vision. You see, the claim, the grace of another day is not enough merely to say that What we're going to do is this. It must mean that we also have to begin to live our life in such a way as to be molded by our faith. You see, it's just not enough for Simon to declare his love for Jesus. 
He was told to feed the lambs of Jesus. You and I are given the grace of another day so that God's expectation for our lives can be met. We are given the grace of another day so that we can start once again to live out our hopes and our purpose. And this idea of the grace of another day is something that's repeated over and over and over in Scripture. When Abraham and Sarah were beyond the age of bearing children, Isaac was born. Moses, who was on the run for having committed murder, was called back to go back and to confront Pharaoh. Elijah, who was at the point of suicide, was challenged by God. Paul, who was confronted as he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, well, he was called to be a church planter. And our gospel story for this morning is also a story of being given the grace of another day. When life comes at us too fast... Perhaps you and I also need to pause and pray for and seek the grace of another day. We need to have the courage that when the gift is given, we will use it as best we can to do the will of God in our lives. And there is absolutely no limit to when the gift can be given. When God interrupts our lives as Jesus did the lives of the disciples early that morning on the Sea of Galilee, it has a way of bringing us face to face with what we ought to be about. Unfortunately, for most of us, well, we like to be comfortable in our safe harbors. Uh, We like to retreat We like to retreat into uh, the comfort of what we know and what we do as opposed to being challenged to grow and to follow him. We like to look back instead of looking forward. I mean, Peter might have protested by the Sea of Galilee. He might have said to Jesus, hey, let somebody else feed your lambs. I'm going to simply be as satisfied with the sentiment of saying I love you. You see, the gift of another day is the opportunity to put our deeds where our words are where our beliefs are, where our faith is. Uh, The gift of another day, quite frankly, is an opportunity to change. It's the opportunity to change. I'm reminded of the story of a wife who decided to put up a little plaque in her kitchen. Uh, And on that plaque that she put up in her kitchen, it simply said in quotations, prayer changes things. 24 hours later, it was gone. It disappeared from the kitchen. And so she goes to her husband who's sitting in the den and she says, "Uh, honey, what's wrong? Don't you like prayer? To which he replied, oh, I like prayer. I just don't like change. Prayer changes things. And when you and I are willing to come face to face with what we're running from, it can change how we see ourselves. It can change how we see others. And we gives us the chance to see how the potential of God might be used through us. Mark Twain once wrote, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. Likewise, when we have been overwhelmed in our living, when we can't depend on what we want, we find ourselves rather needing to seek what God wants. Just as Jesus was waiting on the shore of the Sea of Galilee for Peter and the others, he's waiting to help refocus us. To paraphrase Mark Twain, 
You can't depend on your eyes when your faith is out of focus. You see, the grace of another day brings with it the challenge to change. Peter was no longer going to be able to be comfortable and simply ease back into fishing. Because now he knew that the journey he was set out on wasn't over. He was being given the grace of another day. He was being the given the gift of an opportunity to become what Jesus had envisioned for him. And each and every one of us on our journeys of faith, we too need this gift of another day. We need to be willing to stay committed until we grow to be more of what God would have us be. But it's not an easy task because it's not just one day, but rather it's all of our days. And to be faithful is not easy. It's not merely wishing for a better world but rather it's being ready to work every day for a better world. To realize that with each new day, we are being given the gift of a new opportunity. And at some point, at some point, I would simply say we have to let go. And we have to be willing to try. Peter, if you really, really love Jesus, you're going to walk away from the safe harbor of that boat and you're going to tend his flock. Peter, if you really love Jesus, you're going to have to let go and let God be in control. Peter, if you really love Jesus, you cannot retreat forever. Now, having said that, to claim the gift of another day doesn't mean that we're always prepared to simply charge full speed ahead. In fact, many days we will feel as Peter and the others did when they simply went back to fishing like sitting in an old comfortable chair. Because you see, you and I like the familiar. But here's the thing. If we want the full benefit of another opportunity, we have to push ourselves to go on. As in the lesson from our text, we can't simply say we love God. We have to show it by our actions. A man by the name of Sidney Harris, who was a newspaper columnist in Chicago in the mid part of the 20th century, uh, once told a story about a time that he was giving a talk on creative writing uh, to a group of amateur writers. And after he had made his presentation, someone asked him, said, Mr. Harris, what do you do when you don't feel like writing? And Harris looked at the individual and says, I write. That's the difference between being an amateur and a professional. I write even when I don't feel like writing. Commitment to the task. Commitment to the task is the difference between a nominal follower of Jesus and a truly dedicated disciple. Disciple is a part of the word discipline. And Jesus is calling you and I not to retreat into our safe harbors, not to retreat into our comfort zones, but rather to use the gift of the grace of another day to be about the agenda that he has for each and every one of us. You ever wondered what Jesus was thinking 
as he stood by the lake and he looked out at Peter and those others who were fishing. You ever wonder what he must have felt inside? Wondered about that this week. And I thought, is it possible that Jesus uh, was thinking to himself as he looked out at all of those disciples in the boats out on the Sea of Galilee, is it possible that he thought to himself, you know, these are the heart of the team that I had spent my ministry preparing to go into all the world with the good news. See, thinking, you know what, I have formed them in the community to be my body. They are my plan to spread the word. And now what's happening? They're spending their night fishing. Had they not heard anything that he had said? I mean, was it all going to end right there? I mean, if we count the number of disciples in our text, there were seven of the original 12 who were fishing. Of course, Judas was gone. But four others had gone their separate ways as well. As he stood on the shore of the Sea of Galilee looking at those disciples out in the boat fishing, doing what they were comfortable with in their safe harbor, he had to be worried. And as the disciples came near, Jesus asked them if they caught anything, and they answered they hadn't. So he tells them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. And when they did, they were successful. And it was in that moment that they recognized that it was Jesus. And Peter, in his excitement, jumped into the sea to get to Jesus, leaving the others to bring in the nets filled with fish. Jesus had prepared a fire to cut some of the fish for breakfast. John tells us they shared bread and fish together. And my guess is Jesus in that moment turned and he looked at the boats and the nets. The boats and the nets that those same disciples had been using. Uh, that boat that represented a safe harbor for Peter and the others who had gone out that night. I mean, after all, it had been their life before they met Jesus. But now they're being confronted by Jesus. And he asked them a question. As he looked at the boats and the nets that they had used to fish, he asked them a question. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this which makes you comfortable? Huh? And as we might expect, Peter says, yes. Jesus then answered him three times, then show it. He called Peter to feed the lambs and to tend his sheep. You see, he was challenging Peter to be about what he envisioned when Jesus saw in Peter the potential to be the foundation of the church. But Peter had receded into a safe harbor. And now Jesus is giving him the grace of another day to be faithful. There was still time. There was still time for Peter to become the preacher at Pentecost. Uh, there was still time for Peter to confront the high priest and the elders and the scribes as they assembled. It still gave Peter the time to reach out to Cornelius and to be uh, delivered from prison. And finally, according to tradition, to be martyred in Rome. Jesus makes it very clear that the gift of another day, the grace of another day, is not something to be taken lightly. Because there will come a day when there are no more days. 
Jesus says, but then you'll grow old. You'll stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you to take you where you do not wish to go. What Jesus is saying to Peter is this. Now is your opportunity. Now is your opportunity to get on with the mission that I have given you. Take the grace of another day, Peter. And he challenges him by simply saying, follow me. Let me just add, at this point, the Webster translation. Jesus could have also added on to that phrase, follow me. I didn't choose the safe way, Peter. I marched to Jerusalem knowing what awaited me. Peter, I took on the form of a servant, one obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Peter, drop the nets. Leave the boats. Get out of your comfort zone and follow me. Listen, we too are being challenged. To believe that not only can we have the grace of another day, but in that day we can change. And in changing, we can change the world around us. Drop your nets and follow me. Father God, we come to you this morning. Grateful for the life and the teachings of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we are grateful that you are consistently willing to give us the grace of another day. Father, I recognize that it is so tempting to live within our comfort zone, to live within that which is familiar. But Father, we also know that you've placed a calling upon our lives, that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we sometimes must move out of our comfort zones. We must be willing to stretch. We must be willing to grow. Oftentimes, it means we must be willing to change, to follow you. Father, if there's someone within the sound of my voice this morning who is yet to ever initiate that call to discipleship, they, they yet to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, Father, give them the courage to make that decision. Father, if there's anyone who is looking for a community of faith, they're looking for a place of worship and ministry and fellowship, if they're looking for a place to be challenged to grow, Father, if this is to be that place, give them clarity. <coughs> Father, but for all of us, each and every one of us, may this be a time when we re-examine the living of our lives. And may it be a time when we seek to take advantage of the grace of another day. It's a prayer we offer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. For those of you who are here, I'm going to invite you to stand to join with uh, Jackson and Hannah as they lead us in a song of response. If there are those who are needing to make a decision public, I will be at the back, more than happy to greet you and to talk with you and to pray with you. Jackson.